Welcome everyone to the Garden Nerd Tip of the Week podcast, where garden nerds from around the world talk shop, share stories, and offer their favorite tip. I'm your host, Christy Wilhelmy. This week, we're traveling across the globe to chat with my guest, Adina Osterweich. She's part of the community greening team at the Royal Botanic Garden in Sydney, Australia. In fact, it is tomorrow afternoon for her right now when I'm speaking to her <laughs> the day before. Uh, her work provides support for more than 70 community gardens across the broader Sydney area, and she specializes in working with children and is a permaculture designer. Thanks for joining me, Adina. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, and you clearly are American, so my first question, of course, is how did you end up <laughs> in Australia? I know, I'm a bit of a confusing uh, accent because I'm Grown up and born in America, I um, lived there most of my life, and my husband and I migrated to Australia in 2008, and then I've moved back and forth several times, but we're, we're here to stay at the moment. Got it. So before we get to your work at the Royal Botanic Garden, let's hear a little bit about your own homestead, because I understand that you keep chickens and have a garden of your own. Yes, I do. Um, it's winter here, and uh, so we're dealing with cold gardening at the moment, but um, I'm really fortunate at this point to have a pretty good size yard for Sydney standards. Um, it's a suburban, uh, kind of average suburban space. And um, like you said, I keep chickens. I have a vegetable garden, probably got about 20 fruit trees, although on any day that number could, could be increasing. Um, I used to keep quail when we were living in rental properties, um, and now I've upgraded to my, my dream chickens. Oh. So I've kind of got a permaculture design that I'm working off of. We've been here maybe about 18 months, and so it's still in kind of early stages. Um, and so I'm putting in a lot of the, the structures and the systems to hopefully have everything working really smoothly in the future. Nice. And I'm just curious, why quail? So quail are really wonderful if you're renting or if you have a really compact urban space because they're very small, they're very quiet, um, their eggs are even more high in protein than chicken eggs. So the eggs oh. are fantastic. And they're more resilient against um, disease and, and some of the problems that chickens have. So they're scrappy little birds and can be part of a permaculture system with you know, pest control, um, although they have to be contained because they will fly away. So you have to have maybe some structures that you use to move them around and really protect them from predators. But they're a great addition and were perfect when we were renting and um, and I couldn't convince my landlord to let me have chickens. <laughs> but they let you have quail, interesting. That's, I wonder what the appeal was where they said yes to quail, but not chickens. And something essentially the size of a rabbit patch. Ah, okay. They're birds that kind of nestle under shrubs for protection. So they like little enclosed spaces. So they're less of an impact on land or property than chickens. Um, so I made a strong case to my landlord and eventually <laughs> won him over. Nice. Now, as you said, it is winter right now in Australia because you're in the Southern Hemisphere. And so the, the, uh, the poles are, well, not switched, but we, we are in summer, you are in winter. Uh, mm -hmm. What, if anything, are you growing at the moment? What kind of uh, weather do you have in the winter over there? So we are really fortunate in Sydney to be able to grow all year round. Um, the things that are growing well in the garden right now are all the brassicas, so broccoli, kale, cauliflower, all of those yummy things that are mm -hmm. even enhanced by a bit of cold weather. Um, all of the onions and the things in the onion family. Um, citrus are fruiting right now, the kumquats and oranges and mandarins. So we can have a pretty bountiful um, season in winter here. Our weather at the moment is pretty wet. We've had um, months of rain, essentially. Wow. I think they're saying that we're in our third cycle of a La Nina cycle, so three cycles back to back. We've had massive um, flooding up and down the coast with lots of loss of crops and properties and businesses. So the winter we're having right now isn't really typical. We would mm -hmm. often have a wet season in winter, but not, not what we're having now. We've broken all the records. Every month they're saying, okay, we've broken the records again with the amount of rainfall. Um, so it's been very wet and cold, which is weird because in 2019 to 2020 in the summertime, 
we had the worst bushfire season that we've ever had. So I we had drought, lots of days over a hundred degrees, mm -hmm. um, animals, you know, um, grazing animals dying because of the heat and the drought. So I, I can't really tell you what the climate is here because, um, <laughs> yep. you know, then we lost plants because of extreme heat. Now we're losing plants due to water logging. Um, but I can just tell you it's raining today. I don't know Raised what will happen tomorrow. Wow. And, and so I know, cause here in California, we are also in our, you know, whatever year it is of a drought and it's been pretty bad. And so occasionally we'll get, I think there was a pre, uh, what do you call that? Premature announcement that the drought was over because we got great rain one season. And I was like, no, that's not really true. Does that same thing happen where you are or, or is the drought really over where you are? Um, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that. <laughs> we look at things in the Sydney Basin, like um, the main dam that holds the drinking water for the city, mm -hmm. watching things like the levels in the dam. And during the drought, the dam got so low that the drinking water was nearly compromised because once you get to that low part of the water, then you've got all the sediments and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So we were under water restrictions and you couldn't wash your car and you could only water your garden for certain windows in the morning and the evening. Um, and, and now we've had the dam um, a little bit earlier in the year overflowing because it was way beyond capacity. So then we were having huge problems with the amount of water overflowing out of the dam causing you know erosion and and flooding downstream so i don't know when they declare in and out of drought we can't be in drought now because we've had more than an annual amount of rainfall back in march or april mm -hmm. so yeah maybe a climatologist <laughs> would tell us exactly <laughs> what what is happening at the moment although i imagine they're as confused as we are about a lot of things because it's just crazy yeah. times yeah so what are the big attractions at the Royal Botanic Garden this time of year for you? One thing that is wonderful in the winter time to see is the calyx display at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Sydney, in the city. Um, it's nestled right between the Opera House and Mrs. McCrory's chair with iconic views of the harbor. Um, but the calyx is a beautiful indoor space with one of the largest green walls in the Southern Hemisphere. There's about 20,000 plants in the display. Wow. And it changes from time to time. The current display um, is, I think, called Inside the Tide, and it's a whole theme around um, underwater seascape, but all created through plants. And in there, it's warm, and it's snug, and it's absolutely beautiful and engaging. So that's something I really would do in the wintertime, especially on um, the wet and cold days. Nice. It sounds wonderful and really out of this world, honestly. I don't know that we have that anywhere here. So that's something for people to see if they go. Now let's talk a little bit about your work with the Community Greening Program. Tell us more about that. Yes, yeah, so the Community Greening Program has been going since um, about the year 2000. So it's been going for a while. And what it is, is an outreach Focus program of the Royal Botanic Gardens. So there's about nine people in the team and we are all out on the road in communities, taking the expertise and the resource and the um, kind of the beauty of the gardens out to community. We work with vulnerable people from a variety of backgrounds and each person on our team has a number of gardens that they're um, building relationships with and supporting with horticultural support, um, a lot of you know, training through workshops and um, and working bees, those kinds of things to help people out in the community grow things successfully. And I saw some of the pictures that I'm going to post in the blog post that goes along with this, that you've been working with children as well as like senior citizens. Um, tell me a little bit about what the gardens look like there. Yeah, so in this current role, I'm actually working completely with adults, which is a departure from earlier times of my career um, when I worked primarily with children. Um, I was working the education team in the gardens and that was all with children. And at the moment, um, I'm working almost entirely with adults, which is a real change for me and uh, I'm enjoying it a lot. But the gardens that I support, many of them are in social housing estates. So people in um, housing that's subsidized by the government also in cultural centers, shelters for women and children who um, have escaped uh, situations of domestic violence, um, 
groups that are specifically with refugees with um, a background of trauma, some gardens that are specifically for therapeutic horticulture. So a really wide range of people that I'm working with and a really wide range of spaces as well. Some of the gardens are on rooftops in the urban center. Some are in um, parking lots that are all modular and can roll around. Some of them are um, in-ground crops in you know, larger spaces where you can do more traditional cropping. So it's a very adaptable program working with lots of different people in lots of different physical environments. It sounds really wonderful. There's a lot of diversity in that, in that you're planting in different environments and that you're working with different kinds of people in different spaces. That's wonderful. Now, you, you teach composting and vermiculture and organic pest control methods through this program. I think of Australia, this is, <laughs> sorry, because, uh, you know, New Zealand is known as having nothing that can kill you, but Australia, I think of as having everything that can kill you. Um, <laughs> and my friend who lives there sends me pictures of giant spiders and crazy snakes climbing up their, their ring, you know, staring them down in the camera on their ring uh, doorbell. Um, what is the biggest pest you have to manage during, in these gardens that you're working with? So some of those really dramatic um, pests that you're talking about would be found further north up in Queensland or the Northern Territory. We do have some really dangerous things here in Sydney, but um, maybe not like a python hanging out of a tree. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I'm consistently looking for would be redback spiders. So um, I'm not sure if they're exactly the same as the black widows that we have in the US, but mm -hmm. they look very similar to me and have a similar um, toxicity venom. Is it a venom that a spider has? Anyway, they're about yeah. equally dangerous. And the thing that's tricky is they like to hide under pots or the edges of garden beds. Those kind of nooks and crannies where, um, you know, as a gardener, you're always going to be putting your hands. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that would be a regular thing that I would be looking for with, you know, pots I have stored for propagation or trays of plants that I have to deliver to people. Um, so, you know, not a very big and fearsome looking thing, but something that can do a lot of damage. Yeah. So do you wear gloves a lot when you garden or are you just brave? <laughs> no, I wear gloves. <laughs> We're very careful about um, work health and safety. So really making sure that um, for us as, as gardeners going out into the community and the people that we're helping garden that we're really setting up safe practice so that we're not putting anyone at risk. Yeah. So yeah, I lead by example. I wear gloves. Um, I'm careful. Yeah. And do you have any larger animals that come through and try and, cause we, you know, bunnies, rabbits, uh, we have squirrels, we have, you know, all the kind of traditional American that I can think of animals that come through and like to pilfer your vegetables. What are the typical critters that come through in an Australian garden, or at least in Sydney? So some of the things that we encounter frequently that can be a lot um, of a, they can really be a pain to deal with. One would be brush turkeys. So they're kind of a wild turkey. They look absolutely weirdo bananas. They've got like this you know, leathery neck with like some red and orange, like skin necklaces. They're really weird. <laughs> and um, they build these huge mounds. It's really amazing. The female will lay the eggs in the mound and it's like a huge compost heap. So after they've created this huge mound, the male has created the mound. Then both parents take off and the heat from the compost pile essentially incubates the egg until it hatches and then that little brush turkey has to like dig its way to the surface oh my god but when they're in the season that they are <laughs> building their mounds they can move huge amounts of soil so i've had you know really large garden beds where i've come from one visit to the next and they've emptied the whole thing and it's all piled on the ground with all of the crops ruined <sighs> Oh my um, God. But they're constantly digging through and kicking plants out. So that's one thing. Um, <laughs> we also have possums, which are different possums than the ones we have in the U.S. Um, okay. They're completely different. So you can Google, you know, some Australian possums. There's lots of different, different ones, but they like to come and nibble plants at night. So very similar to the way you would have squirrels in the U.S. come and eat stuff the possums are similar in that way. You'll just come along the next day and everything's just nibbled to nothing. And um, it all happened in the night while you were sleeping, but 
the remnants are there to let you know that the possums came and had a feast. Yeah. So do you install physical barriers of any kind to protect against these? Yes, we do. Um, and at the moment, I'm trialing like three different approaches with the brush turkeys, trying to figure out something that I can replicate across different sites. But because each of our sites are so different, that's hard to do because some we have in-ground beds and some we have raised beds. Um, so I'm, I'm trialing a few things, but um, they're pretty tenacious. So something <laughs> they can move, you know, like a meter of soil within a day or two, you know, it's it's hard to to deter against that. But I'm trying. I'm trying. Got it. All right. Well, keep us posted on how that goes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so biological diversity is one of those really important parts of any garden. I'm wondering what the Royal Botanic offers in terms of its biological diversity. I mean, you mentioned that there are three different sites, so that right probably in and of itself is diverse, yes? Yes, so a couple things to keep in mind is that our Botanic Gardens um, is a scientific institution and the collections that we have are scientific collections. So it's more than a park where people can come and look at beautiful plants. These are actually conservation projects for all of these different species. And because we have the three sites, we have um, cold climate things that we can grow in the mountains that perhaps need, you know, winter frosts, um, you know, deciduous trees, those kinds of things that can be grown there. Um, at the Australian Botanic Garden, you get really intense summer heat, but there's a lot of space for doing some large scale plantings. And then in the city, um, there's a huge diversity of collections, everything from you know, a palm grove with a huge amount of palms to a cacti and succulent garden, um, to you know, gardens themed around Australian native plants. There's so many different things happening. And in addition to that, we have I believe the largest seed bank in New South Wales. So there's oh. conservation happening around seed banking and um, a wonderful team of scientists that are all doing research on um, species resilience to climate change. So what's happening in terms of biodiversity is happening on the ground at the, at the various sites, but also in the science and the research that's happening in the seed banking that's happening um, trying to really build up as much, um, you know, plant material and seed material as possible. That's interesting. Now, I imagine that a lot of the folks that you work with are new to gardening when you start with them. Is that true? That is true. Um, and I try to sometimes lure people in who are very adverse to gardening with, you know, having a morning tea and maybe some cookies and, and maybe a craft activity like gardening light, trying to to get people interested who, who perhaps feel like it's not for them. Yeah, and then so how do you keep people enthused or excited and engaged when things start to go wrong in the garden? Because I know that's sort of hard for people when they're new and they fail, which is normal for failures to happen when you garden, even experts fail. Um, so what are your tricks for keeping people to, you know, engaged? Absolutely, it can be tricky. Um, one of the things that we do with community greening is really try to set people up for success from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And that can happen um, at the stage when we're choosing a site and making sure that we're siting a garden correctly um, to you know, really be successful. Mm -hmm. When you're working in urban areas and particularly in, in housing, sometimes you don't have a whole lot of choice about where they will let you put a garden, but trying to make those decisions to be as successful as possible um, not putting, you know, gardens in the shade or, you know, things <laughs> right. like that. And then we use a lot of wicking bed technology. So it's funny Ooh. to talk about when we're having rain here, but it's really relevant in the summertime. So by using wicking beds, we're kind of giving a little bit of insulation around things that can go wrong because people forget to water plants. Mm -hmm. I mean, that happens everywhere, right? You, you go away for a weekend or or on a vacation and then you come back and yeah, you can see what's happened. So building some security in around watering with wicking beds and then also really careful selection of crops, really trying to choose things that are going to be, you know, hopefully successful. Everybody wants to grow tomatoes, right? We all love tomatoes and, yeah. and that's, you know, people dream of eating that delicious tomato but that's a pretty difficult crop to grow and has a pretty steep learning curve. So we try to select things that are going to be 
largely successful. Make sure we have a mix of flowers in as well. So kind of guaranteeing some level of success and then always being realistic about this is an experiment and part of gardening is learning. And so we accept things that happen as feedback and opportunities to learn. You know, that takes practice and encouragement, but when we set up gardens, they're not set and forget. We come back and work with these people every couple of weeks for the whole duration of the project. So we see how things are going. If things aren't doing well, we make some adjustments. We talk about what's happening and we view it as a, as a learning opportunity and we really celebrate learning opportunities. So maybe the tone of how we approach it takes the sting out of failures a little bit, but you're always gonna have failures. It's just part of gardening. Right, exactly. Now I wanna back up a little to talk a little bit more about like what are wicking beds and what is that technology for those who've never heard of this? Okay, so um, wicking beds, the way they operate is if you have a raised garden bed, it has a sealed base. And in that base is a reservoir of water, maybe just a couple of inches deep. And then there's some kind of a medium between the bottom of the bed and the water and the soil level. So that could be um, some cells that are specially designed to create a, a bit of a gap between, and then something like perlite above that. And the water from the, the reservoir on the bottom wicks or kind of moves up through the garden bed to the root zone of the plants. So the roots in a wicking bed um, tend to go quite deep and kind of access that wet layer at the bottom, but it's really, really water efficient. It's a very water efficient way to grow, um, especially cropping plants. So I've heard some statistics that some of the beds that we use are, are maybe even 70% or more water efficient than overhead watering. Wow. because you're not losing all that moisture through evaporation and transpiration or having it, you know, blowing off when you're trying to water. It's really staying in the soil level. So for us here, especially if you're planting somewhere that's surrounded by bricks and concrete and um, a lot of radiant heat, a wicking bed can be a really successful way to uh, make a garden more successful in those spaces. Nice. Well, it is tip time. Do you have a favorite tip you'd like to share with the garden nerd audience? So my tip I would say is mostly for people who are growing food plants. Okay. Um, I always encourage people to start by making a shopping list. And I don't mean a shopping list so you don't go out of control when you're at the nursery looking at all the plants. <laughs> I mean a shopping list like if you're going to the shop or the farmer's market to pick some um, fruits and vegetables, what do you put in your basket? take that list and start to do a little bit of research or maybe even reach out to someone who has a bit more garden knowledge to talk to them. I've come across many gardeners who use up a lot of their space and a lot of their resource growing something that they don't actually wanna eat. So if you look at things that you like to eat, the things that you actually would wanna put on your plate or have for a snack, that's a good guide for maybe what you can plant in the garden. It might be worth it to talk to someone with some more gardening knowledge or do a bit of research to see what of those things will actually grow in your space or in your climate. Um, but I wouldn't use up a whole lot of time growing food that is not something you wanna eat. So for example, I was working with a family last week and they really love nectarines. So we talked about they have enough space to have several fruit trees they could choose an early, a mid, and a late fruiting nectarine and really get a lot of nectarines across the season if that's what their kids really love to eat. Don't worry, you know, growing something that your family doesn't enjoy or that you don't want to eat. Focus on the things that you would go and, and shop for anyway. Yeah, that's a great idea. We have fruit trees out in our front yard is a mini orchard and we had uh, three trees that we already had, you know, in our possession that we were going to put there. And then we each got to pick another tree that was going to go in. And I picked nectarine and my husband picked kumquat because he likes to eat those as appetite suppressants. Cause once you eat those, you don't really want to eat anything else afterwards. <laughs> and, and that worked for a couple of years, but then after a while, he's like, you know, I'm kind of sick of them and I don't eat them. So we pulled out the tree. We put, we, we, donate it to someone else and they they put it in the ground because they love them and we put in a tangerine and that's exactly what we both wanted so it was perfect i highly agree with you <laughs> it's, it's important to take a consensus and figure out which 
plants are going to work for most of the people in the household, right? And you can make changes as you go along. Like you said, if you've got something going and you realize this isn't really what we want anymore, you know, that space can be used for something else. So it's not too late to make a, make a change. Right. Well, thank you so much, Adina, for sharing that expert tip and for being a guest on the Garden Nerd Tip of the Week podcast. Thank you for having me. How do people find you and the Royal Botanic Garden in Sydney? For the Botanic Gardens, you can go to at RBG Sydney, and that'll get you to Instagram, Facebook, all those good things. Um, if you're interested in seeing my garden um, and my journey with my, my chickens and my permaculture project, you can follow me at SAP and Green AU on Instagram and uh, yeah, see, see pictures of chickens and that sort of thing. Okay. And that is Seth and Green? SAP. S-A-P. Ah, SAP and Green. A-U. A-U. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, All right, garden nerds, you'll find a link to the Royal Botanic Gardens website this week. We'll also share links to both Adina and the garden's social media feed so you can visit another continent anytime. That's it for this week. Subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you stream. Visit us for tons of free gardening information at gardennerd.com. Show your support for this podcast and the other free stuff on Garden Nerd by becoming a Patreon subscriber. You'll find us on Instagram and Twitter under Garden Nerd One, on Facebook as Garden gardennerd.com and of course our garden nerd youtube channel happy gardening